Good morning, everyone. Glad you found us for our online worship. And if you would please take a moment, scan that QR code. Let us know everybody that's watching with you this morning. And if you're not feeling very well, we pray that you would have a quick recovery uh, so that we can see your smiling face back here at, at, in the sanctuary at St. Stephen. Or if you're just joining us online, we are glad that you took the time to worship with us. So today we're going to look at uh, the book of Romans, St. Paul's letter to the Romans at first chapter. Uh, in case you didn't catch that, I shot a little teaser out on our Right Now Media uh, for you to kind of get digging into God's Word. And also, if you're watching right now and you want to be a part of that Right Now Media, certainly uh, let us know here at the church office. We'll get you a link so that you can access those videos too. So, that being said, glad you are here. Let's get going with our opening song. our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We read responsibly Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourner. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. 
your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. We continue with our confession and forgiveness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And hear the good news of our loving Heavenly Father, for he indeed has had mercy upon us and has sent his Son, Jesus, to die for us. So in the stead and by the command of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and serve the Lord. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone. Our first reading for the fifth Sunday in Easter comes from Acts chapter 6 and 7. St. Luke writes, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, and we will point to this, who, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procreus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, 
and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and of those from the Sicilia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at, a, at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading for today, and also the basis for the sermon today, comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, the first chapter. Paul, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart from the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to, the, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of your faith, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without season. Without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under, un, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for its power of God for salvation to ever, for the, for it, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in its righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome to those who are joining us online this week and blessings to you in this fifth week of Easter. Well, today in Sunday school, we're going to learn about the beginning of the church. Now that we're in Easter, we hear a lot of readings from the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is where we hear the church getting its first start, uh, the kind of the, the beginning of the church, if you will. Now I want to pose to you 
this question is, what do disciples do? I'm sure you've heard the word disciple before, but take a minute and think about what does the word disciple mean and what do disciples do? Now that you've thought of, about it for a second or two, let me ask you this question. Are you a disciple? Yes, you who I'm talking to online, they're sitting at home. Are you a disciple? You are. You are a disciple. Now you might be thinking, Vicar, I'm only three or four or five or six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. How can I be a disciple? Well, guess what? In Matthew, Jesus tells the disciples, go and make what? Disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. So if you've been baptized, guess what? You now have the title of disciple. And as disciples, guess what? Jesus tells us to go make disciples. And what does that entail? Well, he says, go tell others about Jesus. Now, you might not have a car. And you might not be able to tra travel to the ends of the earth and tell other people about Jesus. But what you can do is you can go home and you can talk about what you heard in church at home. Right? You can talk to your parents about Jesus. You can ask them questions about Jesus, about Scripture. And that's part of what being a disciple means. And guess what? The first people in the early church, or I should say the early church, guess where they met? Not in church like we meet at, right? Not in a building like St. Stephen. They met in the home. So guess what? You can go home today, and that's what I challenge you to do. Go, as you are home today and throughout the week, ask your parents about Jesus. Ask your parents about Bible stories. Ask your parents about what you've learned in Sunday school because that's what disciples do. Disciples talk about Jesus. And guess what? If you can talk, you can speak, and I know you can, then you can talk about Jesus. So that's your goal because that's what our Lord would have us to do. So let's fold our hands and pray. Dear God, we thank you that you've given us the gift of Jesus. We also thank you for giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit, which you've given us through baptism. Lord, now that you've given us your Holy Spirit, help us to talk about Jesus. Help us to learn about Jesus in our homes, Lord, because that is what you would have us to do. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. To you, online viewers, chosen by our Heavenly Father for His good purposes, namely gospel proclamation in your life, grace and peace be to you. So today we look at the St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the first chapter, and I entitled the sermon, No Shame. Of course, that is connected to St. Paul's statement, right? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. We'll get into that a little bit more as we move right along. 
But it's probably important to remember when St. Paul actually writes his epistle to the Romans. St. Paul writes while he is in Corinth, while he is serving the church there during his third missionary journey, which dates the authorization or the authoring of this particular epistle to the Romans about 58 AD, which is kind of important. It's important to understand that because this epistle in his grand scope of all the epistles that he did write comes a little bit later in his life or career or however you would like to place that. So in it, we see a very developed proclamation of the gospel. Luther writes on this and is quoted in our Lutheran study Bible. He says, this epistle is really the chief part of the New Testament and is truly the purest gospel. It is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but also that he should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. We can never read it or ponder it over too much, for the more we deal with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Indeed, pretty strong words from St. Paul. I guess we better all get working on our memorization of the letter to Romans. <laughs> also, there's another aspect to it too. In, in it, we see that St. Paul is dealing with this growing Jewish zealotism that is taking place within the Christian community. What do I mean by that? Maybe, perhaps you remember this whole circumcision issue. Some were saying that the Gentiles had to be circumcised in order to be true believers of Jesus Christ. Well, St. Paul deals with that over and over again, and it pops up in chapter 2, 3, and 4. And most importantly, we get this quote in Romans chapter 2, that circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit. Ah, and that gets us to what we are talking about today. That is the whole gospel, the whole counsel of God, which also means our life lived together in Christ Jesus, our living our lives for our Lord. St. Paul gives this personal faith statement, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. No shame. Now, there is a good stance for you and to me to be in our life lived in Christ. Live it with no shame, giving everything to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the proclamation of God through our lives in the way we live it, the way we teach it, the way we believe it, every aspect of us. For us here at St. Stephen, we've kind of identified what that gospel life looks like in our guiding statement. We are Team Jesus, joyfully empowering others to be Christ followers. If you haven't had an opportunity to check that out and the pillars that go along to support what that means, you need to dive a little deeper into that. Lately, we've been releasing that. Deaconess Kim and Judy, well... We all know uh, the story behind that, right? Our Sunday school program uh, with Denise Somke being Judy, they lay out perfectly a better understanding for you and for me about our pillars and what that means to be a Christ follower. I get it. Sometimes there is fear involved, but let's remember that's one of the biggest commands that Jesus gives to us over and over again through that New Testament. Do not fear. St. Paul gives the Romans, a longer guiding statement than, well, what we have. <laughs> and he also gives them more pillars, 16 chapters of pillars to be exact. Listen how St. Paul phrases this in verses 4 through 6. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. To bring about the obedience of faith. Do you understand what that means? The apostleship, that which we have been called to. Not that we are apostles. Of course, that was 
identified by Christ Jesus given specifically to people, but we remember what their role in God's church was to equip the saints for ministry. That's you and I. And how do we do ministry? Well, we do ministry by being obedient to the faith for the sake of His name among all nations, including you who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. See, talk about purpose. Talk about a guiding statement. Well, that's exactly what we get here in these words. Just like the Romans were called to obedience by St. Paul through the power of the Holy Spirit, so it is that you and I are called to obedience too. Obedience. Meaning, to hear Jesus' words, to obey those words, and to spread. That is, to help others become Christ followers too. You see, that's our role in this life. Now, I'm going to show you a video, and it's rather simplistic, but I think it asks us a good question at the end and helps us to determine, well, where it is that we actually find ourselves in this obedient life lived to Christ. So, we live in this world and it's characterized by brokenness. We don't have to look very hard to see. There are things like disease, disasters, wars. There's a lot of pain in this world, but this is not God's original design. God has a perfect design. And the way that we have gotten ourselves into brokenness is through something that the Bible calls sin. Sin is turning away from God's design and pursuing our own way. And that leads us to brokenness. Brokenness eventually leads us to death, and this death will separate us from God forever. But God doesn't want us to stay in brokenness, so He's made a way out, and that way is Jesus. Jesus comes and He enters into our brokenness, and the death that we deserve for pursuing brokenness, Jesus takes our place and dies on a cross, and His body is broken for us. And three days after He dies, He rose from the dead, and He made a way out of brokenness. And people try many things to get out of brokenness, things like religion, things like success or relationships, education or drugs and alcohol, but none of these things can get us out of brokenness. The only way out is Jesus. And if we turn from our sin and believe that Jesus died for us and rose from the dead, we can leave brokenness and grow in a relationship with God and pursue his design. And more than that, we can go. We can be sent, just like Jesus, back into brokenness to help others come through Him to pursue God's design. Now, there's two types of people in the world. There are people that are pursuing God's design, and there's people that are still in brokenness. We have to ask ourselves, where are we? So, where do you think you are? So, where do you see yourself in pursuing God's design? Or are we trapped in pursuing our own design? Well, I don't know about you, I can only speak for me, sort of depends on the month or day or even the moment, if we are being honest, right? You see, it's easy for us to turn this whole thing, this this life lived in Christ, to more of a theoretic item rather than a practicing item, right? In other words, Romans 6 (laughs) St. Paul reminds us, right? Jesus loves to forgive and I love to sin. It's a perfect match. Well, of course, we know that's not how it works. And then there's Romans 7. The good that I want to do, well, well, I end up not doing that, but rather the stuff that I do do, I know that I shouldn't be doing. Well, that's what I seem to kind of keep getting stuck with. But what does St. Paul say we need more of? Not more of ourselves, but we need more of Jesus. And like St. Paul says, or like Luther says about St. Paul's letter to the Romans, we need more reading in Romans. Like verse 17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And St. Paul certainly unpacks that for you and for me in the book of Romans. And we can understand that from a more deep perspective. Not a works righteousness, but rather 
a righteousness for doing what it is that we are called to by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are called to obediently follow Jesus in all things. I think this little diagram spells it out perfectly. We hear all of Jesus' commands. We obey all of Jesus' commands. And we do have that command to teach others to do the same. It's the Great Commission, right? As St. Paul, or as, as St. Matthew tells us, as we go about our life, we do these things. We teach people to know Jesus and to follow Jesus too. We know that St. Paul makes it to Rome finally. History gives us that. We have pretty good accounts that we can know so that even when he was writing ahead of time that he was hoping to get there, we know that he did eventually get there. And that's pretty cool because he wrote this, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Isn't that awesome? That's one of the big reasons St. Paul wanted to go there, to, to be encouraging one another. And as Luther stated for us earlier, in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, we are given all that that strengthens us to live our life for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, just as St. Paul did too. Over the next few months, we are going to dive into Romans in our sermons because we're going to focus in on the book of Romans as the lectionary has brought it to us in spades this year. There's a couple of Sundays where we won't be focused in on that, but I want you to stay focused on the book of Romans over these next few months. Get a chance Sit down and read it. Even if it's a couple of verses per day, dive into God's Word in Romans. And if you want to be the overachiever, follow Martin Luther's example and memorize the whole book. Now, again, that's probably a stretch. But you see, our guiding statement mirrors that. And these 16 chapters that St. That Paul gives to us in that book of Romans mirrors our pillars. Every single pillar, it touches on that. And that's how we see that this is an important book for you and for me. And most important, it solidifies our understanding of our relationship with God in Christ Jesus. Because what does Romans say? There isn't anything in all of creation that can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace which surpasses our human understanding guard your hearts and keep your minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. We continue our worship by returning to our Lord a portion of the gifts he has blessed us with and entrusted to us for his kingdom work. We have several giving options for you to utilize. As St. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Arrange in advance for the gift you have promised, so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an extraction. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all contentment in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. For this week's highlights from the Team Jesus News, attention ladies, the next Gather Around the Tables event will be this Friday, May 12th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Come to enjoy fellowship, conversation, and more with your sisters. Friends and neighbors are always welcomed. Contact the office to reserve your seat as soon as possible. Next, we hope you'll join us for this year's stellar Vacation Bible School happening June 18th through June 22nd from 5.30 to 8 p.m. 
This is for ages three through fifth grade in terms of participation, and we also need a lot of adult volunteers. You can register to sign up or to volunteer by scanning the QR code in this week's Team Jesus News. We will have an intergalactic good time at this year's VBS, so don't miss out. Finally, Silver Saints will gather next Thursday, May 18th at 12 noon. All members, friends, and family 55 plus are welcome to join us for food, fellowship, and fun. To learn more about these highlights and everything else that is happening here at St. Stephen, please check this week's copy of the Team Jesus News. At this time, we make confession of our Christian faith to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This week in prayer, we've been asked to pray for, or Kendra McClaskey has asked us to pray for uh, her granddaughter, Kenley, uh, as her father's being deployed. Kerry Snyder has asked us to pray for Randy E. at the loss of his grandmother and pray for Mackenzie T., who is battling colon cancer. We pray for a peaceful and a fruitful transition between preschool directors here uh, for our small saints learning program as as we prepare to uh, usher in our new preschool director 
Audrey Lammers has asked us to pray for Cindy. This is a longtime friend of hers who is having surgery to remove a cancerous tumor. We continue to pray for uh, Matt Rierick's family, but especially for his father, Wayne. Michelle Short has asked us to pray for the family and friends of uh, her st stepmother, uh, Juanita, who passed away uh, this last week. Continue to pray for Sophie. This is the granddaughter of Jane Putnam. We pray for Elena. This is a co-worker um, of Michaela Abel, who is in need of our prayers. So let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, through the power of Christ's resurrection, you adopt all who believe in him. Receive us as your newborn children and nourish our faith through the pure spiritual milk of your word, that we may dwell in your presence forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, you have promised to build up your church to be a holy priesthood, that your people might offer spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving acceptable to you. Bless your church and bring all congregations together. Bless all pastors, especially Pastor Joe who proclaim Christ to us, bless the church, bless all church workers and those who are preparing for full-time church vocations, especially Ethan Luft, as he prepares for vicarage. We ask you also to bless our small saints program. Uh, we give you thanks for the service of your servant, Beth Backus, and we ask that you would give us a fruitful transition as our new director, Angie, is preparing to uh, preparing to come over and work uh, on uh, your behalf. Be with, uh, again, be with all full-time church workers, all deaconesses, all DCEs, all LTEs, that they may be supplied, that, that the church might be supplied with faithful leaders and servants of your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, build up your households, the households of your people, that your holy children, begotten in baptism, may grow in your grace and share together in the forgiveness and in life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, your power brought all things into being and still preserve what you have made. Bless Joseph, our president, the Congress of these United States, Mike, our governor, and all elected and appointed civil servants. Lead them to honor you and your purpose, establishing order and justice, encouraging virtue and protecting all life. Give them wisdom and moderation to lead for the well-being of the nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Heavenly Father, for the sake of your dear Son, who restored all things by his cross, grant healing, comfort, deliverance, and peace to those in need. Bless the sick, the sorrowing, the anxious, the fearful, the homebound, the homeless, the dying, and all who request our prayers, including Laura, Randy, Mackenzie, Cindy, Wayne, the family of Juanita Solens, Sophie, Elena, and all those in need of your healing. Lord, at last give them entrance into your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your servant, St. Stephen, whom your Son has received into his glory. May we imitate his faith and love to speak your truth with boldness, forgiving those who sin against us as Christ forgave his persecutors from the cross. When our last hour comes, O Lord, let us fall asleep in him and be born into eternal life for the sake of him who was born into our flesh to redeem it, even Jesus Christ our Lord. All this we ask in his name. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with and abide with you always. Amen.
Yeah. 